Hello, this is Professor Immler again, and I'm here to talk uh, very quickly about some major views of identity. So some questions that come up are, how do we characterize ourselves? How should we identify ourselves? What makes us the same person over time? Does consciousness make us individual selves identifiable over time? So here are the major views on this. Uh, the first one is what we call the Lockean view. Then we have the animalist view. Then we have the bundle theory of the self. And then we have the religious view. So first we're gonna look at the Lockean view. And we're actually gonna start with Descartes, which we've looked at earlier in the class. So Descartes says that he knows he exists and continues to exist as long as he is the th a thing that thinks. This consciousness that allows us to know that we exist composes what he calls the soul. It's a substance, and he thinks that it's independent of the body. So for Descartes, self-identity depends upon consciousness, one's thinking, perceiving, etc. So then we move to Locke. Now Locke believes that self-identity depends upon having the same self-consciousness. Now by consciousness, we mean awareness of the self as a continuing object. So the same self-consciousness and memories over time. He differs from Descartes because he distinguishes substance, the soul, and consciousness. So Locke's idea that memory is what constitutes self-identity is inspired by Descartes and the Cartesian notion that a person's relationship to their own thoughts is unique. I can't get inside your head. You can't get inside mine. Um, so you can't think my thoughts. I cannot think yours. So according to Locke, memory provides this infallible link between what we might call different stages of a person. One issue that comes up naturally with Locke is the question of what happens if there's a break in my memories or self-awareness. So let's say that I have a psychotic episode or I become highly intoxicated due to taking whatever chemicals or, I don't know, someone roofies me and I legitimately, and it's legitimately, do not remember what happened the night before. Can I be held responsible for my actions during that time according to Locke? Given that there is a break in my memory and self-awareness after the fact, so once I recover, it would seem that Locke would have to say that we should not be held accountable for what we did during the memory lapse. He even admits such in his writing. However, he also says that if we had a society that did that, legally speaking, so we did not hold, in his words, like drunkards accountable for their actions when they were drunk, um, that society would not work. And so he would say, you know, forensically is the language he uses, even though like logically and actually we should not be held responsible, but forensically we should be held responsible for what our bodies do whenever there is a break in our normal consciousness. Uh, so we have to act as if we are accountable. He also uses uh, a Freaky Friday argument to bolster his view of the fact that we are our consciousness, not our bodies. So I don't know if you know Freaky Friday, those uh, couple of movies. He actually uses The Prince and the Pauper because, you know, Freaky Friday, uh, those movies weren't around uh, in the 1700s. Uh, so he says that if our minds, memories, self-awareness, etc., were somehow magically or scientifically shifted into another body, like so if, we, if you and I switch minds, um, where would the us be? Where would we be? Where would our self be if that happened? Uh, would it be we are in our original bodies? Or would we be in that different, that new body where our memories are, have been shifted into, uh, etc.? Locke would claim that in such a thought experiment, we would obviously be in the new body. And if that's the case, then bodies are what's known as accidental to the self. 
that we just happen to be housed in bodies, uh, but we are not our animal bodies. Now that is going to be uh, hotly contested by the next view we look at, which is the animalist view. Okay, so now we want to go and look at the animalist view. The animalist view of the self is quite different from the consciousness view. So it says that we are coextensive with our animal bodies. We cannot separate our minds from our bodies. In fact, here's some of their reasoning. Our minds are dependent upon our brains. Our brain is a part of our body. Our bodies give rise to or create a sense of consciousness of the body or mind. So we know whenever, like back in that example earlier, if I am given certain chemicals, I start to think differently. Um, if I have certain brain injuries, like legitimate brain injuries, my personality changes. I lose some of my memories. So it would seem that our consciousness, our awareness of self, our memories are dependent upon our physical brains and what is going on physically, chemically, etc. in our brains. And if this is the case, then consciousness comes out of the body. I'm sorry, consciousness arises from the body. And if that's the case, consciousness cannot be where the self resides. Instead, it must reside in our animal body because without the animal body, there is no mind. So it makes no sense to talk about the consciousness apart, and that's the key thing, apart from our body. And this would mean that the body, our physical bodies, that is the location of the self. Um, uh, given all of this, it is ludicrous to suggest that we are merely our minds. Descartes is completely wrong. Uh, Locke is completely wrong. We are our animal selves. The next theory of the self is called the bundle theory of the self. And we often think of it in terms of thinkers such as Hume and Nargajuna, or just Buddhist philosophy in general. Uh, now this point of view suggests that there's no one specific place. It's not the body, it's not the soul, it's not consciousness. Um, it's not one specific place where we reside. There is no specific self. Instead, what we think of as the self is actually a bundle of components that we mistake for, for a unified self. So this might be things like our bodies plus our brains plus our consciousness plus our memories plus the very act of sensing and perceiving the world. All of those things taking, taken together give a rise to this notion or experience of the self. But you take any one of those away and the whole thing breaks down. So um, they, they will often even go a step further and say that what Locke and Descartes think of as our mind or consciousness is actually not a single thing in and of itself either. They will look to modern psychology that tells us that the self is a bundle of things, such as the ego, the id, and the superego. So we can even break down consciousness or the mind into different components. And you take any one of those away and that changes or that goes away. So we can't even talk about our minds as a single thing. Uh, and we can't talk about our bodies as a single thing. We can't talk about our consciousness as a single thing. Uh, so we are in fact a bundle of all of these things. And if you cut that little cord, we fall apart. So this means that uh, there is no actual self in any one location that we can identify in any of those individual parts. We are only a self when those things are bundled together. So if that's the general idea of bundle theory. We're going to look at Hume next. Uh, he concludes that the self is simply a fiction. Now we're going to talk about Buddhism. And we can look specifically at Narg Nargajuna. You're doing that for your readings this week. Uh, in general, Buddhism comes out of Hinduism as a reform, a reform of Hinduism. Now, Hinduism claimed that we are, at our core, what's known as an Atman, or a drop of the universe spirit, Brahman. Buddhists claim 
that what was thought of as the self, the Atman in Hinduism, is in fact an illusion of a permanent thing that is caused by a culture and an illusory material world. And in fact, they say that this illusion of a permanent self and a permanent world, this is the source of our suffering. Uh, the Buddhists say that instead of the Atman or self, we are on Atman or ana Atman, a non-self. And they, similar to Hume, describe the illusion of self as the five aggregates. And so the five aggregates are form or our material bodies, sensation, right? The very act of like sensing the world, uh, perception, where I take in the sensations and I uh, form them into ideas. And then those go into my memories as mental formation. And then I have consciousness and awareness of these things and uh, this bundle of things as a continuing object. Now, upon death, the Buddhists say that all of these things fade away, right? So let's, let's run through them. Our form or body literally decays. Our bodies turn into dirt. After we die, we cease to sense the world. After death, we stop to then turn our senses of the world into ideas. And after death, we no longer have mental forms or memories or form new ones. Our mind goes away. It, well, it dies. Now, consciousness, consciousness is interesting in Buddhism. So it's a little bit different. So they would say uh, when it comes to consciousness, it should dissipate, fade away. But they also say that our consciousness, remember, is trained to think of itself as a permanent object and that it holds so tightly to that idea that it refuses to fade away upon death. It collects around itself another set of aggregates. So it reincarnates as another person. This is how reincarnation works in Buddhism. Uh, so with consciousness in the bundle view in Buddhism, it's a little bit complicated. Okay, so lastly, we have the religious view. And this is held by groups such as uh, Hindus, Muslims, uh, Jews, Christians, etc. It's very similar to the Lockean view. But instead of relying upon consciousness uh, as what the self is, um, they identify the self with a imperfect but eternal being or thing uh, that goes by a variety of names such as soul, spirit, or Atman. And that's where the self resides. And we were given, our bodies are inhabited by this spirit or Atman and it comes from something outside of us, right? So maybe uh, the Christian God created a soul and then put it in uh, this developing fetus or this Atman, uh, something similar. Um, now, if they're right, if the religious people are right about their notions of the soul being eternal and inhabiting these accidental material bodies, then this can answer a lot of questions. So notice the utility of this view. Um, whenever we ask questions of, well, like think about the ship of Theseus example that we have uh, in this unit. At what point can a thing change and still be that change? Well, when it comes to humans, well, we say, well, does that thing still have that same soul? Yes. Okay. Question answered. Um, so it, it, it gives us a lot of uh, answers to some pretty difficult problems. Um, however, think about our unit on knowledge, epistemology. How do we come to know that we are our souls? Well, in the religious view, we have to go off of either a religious authority told us, or it's an argument from authority, or my religious text tells me so. So it's an argument from revelation. But notice that's not an those aren't arguments from reason. 
or it's not things that we can prove empirically. So I can't measure your soul. I can't uh, see it. I can't test for it. We have no, um, by the tools through which we acquire most of our knowledge, we cannot apply that to the soul question or most religious questions in general. We can say, is this consistent with the rest of the views that we hold? But we can't prove that it's true or, or, fal or, or false, given the means that, that we have to identify true statements with, with a lot of our other matters. Um, so while this is nice, it's very difficult to demonstrate other than just merely asserting it, saying, well, I have a soul. Why? Because I say that I have a soul, or my Bible, or my Quran, or my Upanishads say I have a soul, or Atman, etc. Um, how can we prove that a given book is from the divine? All the same problems come up. That doesn't mean a given book is not from the divine. It just means we can't demonstrate that it is. Uh, and that becomes a very difficult problem if we're trying to find good reasons and solve these problems uh, in a critical way, not just a, well, this is what I've been told, so this is what I'm going to accept. Um, so it's a problem. So these are the, the main views. The religious view, we are our souls. The bundle view, we are not in any particular place, but we are a bundle of things. The animalist view that we are coextensive with our animal bodies. Uh, and then finally, the one we talked about first, the Lockean view, we are our minds, or more specifically, our consciousness. So with this, um, these are some ideas to play with in the forums and as we go forward in this class, and maybe if you choose this topic, uh, on your paper. And if you want more resources, especially like on the animalist view, I can give those to you. Uh, so anyway, with that, um, thank you for listening. I'll see you in the forums.